Hey everybody, I'm Silas, and welcome to Silas Ibology. Let's expand our mind. This is a series where we talk about the research on psilocybin, the psychedelic prodrug found in magic mushrooms. We'll be breaking down and discussing the scientific literature, one study at a time, from past to present. If you'd like to support the show, please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Real quick, before jumping into today's episode, let me know if today sounds any better than usual. I'm trying a little bit of a different studio setup. I can't really say studio, it's a closet, but <laughs> things are set up a little bit differently, and I'm curious to see if it sounds any better or worse. So, let me know. Anyway, today's episode is on the article titled, Pathologic Laughter as Manifestation of the Psychotomimetic Action of Psilocybin, published in 1965 by researchers from Palaki University, if I pronounce that right, which I found out is one of the second oldest universities in the Czech Republic. This study is pretty brief, and there's not really a lot that we can draw from it. We'll talk a bit more about why in a second. But it was just too interesting to me not to discuss. The title is, of course, what initially caught my attention. I had honestly never thought much about pathological laughter before, but I have a whole new appreciation for researchers in this field. The study actually gets even more intriguing than the title suggests, though, when you hear more about the experiment itself. For this study, the researchers gave 100 participants an average dose between 0.12 and 0.16 milligrams of psilocybin per kilogram of body weight. So again, as we saw in a previous episode, the lower range of what's commonly used in modern day research. The interesting part is that 90 of those 100 participants were individuals with organic brain damage, while 10 were considered healthy controls. The term organic brain damage is just being used to specify that these individuals all sustained some form of brain injury prior to enrolling in the experiment, and such injuries could have been caused by a number of different factors, such as blunt trauma, stroke, cancer, etc. After enrollment, the researchers then grouped these 90 participants based on the location of their injury, i.e. which brain regions were impacted. I think the reason for the use of a patient population is because pathological laughing and crying, which is sometimes also called pseudobulbar affect, if I pronounce that correctly as well, can occur as a side effect of brain damage resulting from things like neurological conditions, stroke, trauma, etc. Now, as some of you listening may have experienced, psilocybin can induce bouts of laughter, which may appear ostensibly similar to what these patients experience themselves. This prompted these researchers to see what happens when you give psilocybin to a patient population that is already prone to experiencing such uncontrollable episodes of laughing. Before going further into the study, I think it'll be useful to talk a bit more about what we know now about pathological laughter and what we think might be causing it. First, Pathological laughter is an uncontrollable episode of laughing. This laughter can be in response to a funny stimulus, although in these cases the amount of laughter that's elicited is usually disproportionate to how funny the stimulus was. It can also be completely unprompted, meaning that nothing really triggered the episode other than something going on in their brain. Now, pathological laughter can also be accompanied by either emotions that are normally associated with laughter, such as feeling happy, or the laughter can be called mood incongruent, meaning that instead of feeling happy, someone experiencing pathological laughter may be feeling angry or upset, despite being unable to stop laughing. As an aside, this reminded me of a talk that I listened to about arousal non-concordance, which I highly recommend. This would be when your body may experience a physiological arousal, where blood flows to your genitals, but you're not actually feeling psychologically aroused or interested in engaging in sexual behavior. Anyway, what I saw when looking through the research is that like most things, multiple brain regions have been implicated in producing pathological laughter. This may in part mean that different brain regions are responsible for different types of pathological laughter 
One analysis from a 2003 paper, for example, suggested that while the amygdala, thalamus, hypothalamus, and the dorsal brainstem contribute to emotionally driven involuntary laughter, there's a tract originating from the premotor cortex down the ventral brainstem that appears to contribute to voluntary laughter. This study also mentioned that it appears like the pontine tegmentum, one of the two parts of the pons located within our brainstem, may act as a laughter coordinating center. This was interesting to me because I saw this region come up in other studies. For example, there was a 2018 study that noted that lesions to the cerebellopontine junction, located between the cerebellum and the pons, produced uncontrollable episodes of laughing and crying. A 2015 case study examining a 40-year-old man with pathological laughing found he had pontine lesions as well. In addition, a 2001 paper suggesting that lesions interrupting the cerebroponto-cerebellar pathway are critically responsible for pathological laughter and crying. These pathways can run from premotor and motor cortical areas through the pons and to the cerebellum. I know that's all way more than we need to know to understand this study, but I thought it was interesting to learn about anyway, and it might give us some context when understanding the results. Getting into the study itself, the first key part to discuss is how pathological laughter was classified by the researchers. The researchers chose to distinguish between three types of pathological laughter. Facilitated laughter, unmotivated laughter with adequate affect, and unmotivated laughter with inadequate affect. The first question I had about this study was how they determined whether the laughter was facilitated versus unmotivated. For facilitated laughter, did the researchers provide some stimulus, like make participants listen to a stand-up routine? Or did the researchers just observe participants and, when they started laughing, ask them why they were laughing to see if they had a reason? I'm not sure, and they don't describe it at all in the paper, which, to be fair, is really more of a brief report. Still, this is a limitation, because we don't really know the full methodology and thus can't exactly try to replicate the procedure. The second question I had about this study is whether the 90 patients in the experiment ever reported having experienced pathological laughter prior to the study. Although brain injury was known to sometimes cause this condition, the authors at no point say whether these participants had actually ever experienced it themselves. This is another limitation because now we have no idea whether psilocybin is reducing the incidence of the symptom, increasing it, or doing absolutely nothing. The other most substantial limitation is that the authors only report percentages and counts, but no confidence intervals or significance tests. Since a lot of the results compare between patients with different localizations of brain damage, and the samples for these subgroups are pretty small, these findings are likely not statistically significant. The sample gets even smaller when they try to break out between the three types of laughter. With those limitations in mind, I want to make it clear that we shouldn't take any of these findings as proof of really anything. But that's okay. As I've mentioned before on the podcast, part of this series is simply exploring what kind of research has been conducted on psilocybin. So even if we can't always take answers away from the studies we discuss, we can at least see what questions are being asked, and maybe start to form our own questions for future exploration. With that said, let's briefly go through what they report in the paper. The first primary report was that during the experiment, pathological laughter appeared in 7 out of the 10 healthy controls after administering psilocybin. Of the patients with organic brain damage, 47 out of the 90 participants experienced at least one episode of pathological laughter after being administered psilocybin. Now, within this group of patients specifically, the greatest incidence of pathological laughter was seen in patients with parietal lobe lesions, which occurred in 10 out of 12 of these patients. The lowest incidence was found in two groups of patients, those with lesions to their occipital lobes, where pathological laughter occurred in only 5 out of 18 of these patients, and those with lesions to their temporal lobes, 
where pathological laughter occurred in 7 out of 16 of these patients. This same pattern, where incidences of pathological laughter was highest among patients with parietal lobe lesions and lowest in patients with occipital or temporal lobe lesions, was seen specifically for both facilitated laughter and unmotivated laughter with adequate affect. Now, this is where it would have been really nice to know how many of these patients already experienced pathological laughter prior to the study, because it's possible that patients with parietal lesions are already at a greater risk for pathological laughter than patients with occipital and temporal lesions. In fact, the research we discussed earlier might suggest this is the case, since the parietal lobe would be part of the cerebroponto-cerebellar pathway that may be responsible for voluntary laughter. This is also where it would have been really nice to know how they defined facilitated laughter and whether it was in response to a stimulus. For example, if it was in response to a visual stimulus, then maybe damage to the occipital lobe, which contains our visual processing, would interfere with the ability to have an elicited response. Or maybe it was an auditory stimulus, and therefore damage to the temporal regions would inhibit the ability to produce a response in that case as well. The other key thing that the researchers noted was that when looking at the incidents broken out by the type of laughter, they found that 15 of the 100 participants exhibited facilitated laughter, whereas 42 participants exhibited unmotivated laughter with adequate affect. Only one participant exhibited unmotivated laughter with inadequate affect. What we can at least tell from this finding is that it means psilocybin doesn't seem to produce mood incongruent laughter. Now, the last key finding that I want to bring up sounds interesting, but it's a bit difficult to interpret since they don't properly describe the actual analyses they conducted or the methods they used to take these assessments. The researchers note that, quote, the incidence of imperative laughter in patients as well as in healthy volunteers correlated with the incidence and intensity of the psychotomimetic and hallucinogenic effect of psilocybin. What's confusing to me is I'm not sure how they assess this. For example, they make no mention of how they measured the psychotomimetic and hallucinogenic effect of psilocybin. What it sounds like they might have done is conduct a questionnaire or symptom checklist and look to see if scores on the checklist predicted how likely participants were to experience pathological laughter. Now, one thing you might have noticed is that so far we've only discussed the number of participants who either have or have not experienced pathological laughter as a dichotomous outcome. You might be wondering, did the researchers examine the number of times this laughter occurred as a continuous outcome? Unfortunately, it doesn't look like they did, which in my opinion is another detriment to the study, because continuous variables often allow for much richer data analysis. So overall, like I said, I think the study is interesting, but it leaves me with many more questions than answers. I personally would love to know if the difference between patients with differentially localized lesions is something that's replicable on a larger scale, and if so, what's driving the difference? Is it because occipital and temporal lesions inhibit psilocybin-induced uncontrollable laughter? Or is it because parietal lesions make you more susceptible to such laughter? Considering the prevalence of laughter was somewhat similar between healthy controls and patients with parietal lesions, both of which were much higher than the incidence among patients with occipital and temporal lesions, although we don't know if that was statistically significant, My guess based on this data would be the former, that occipital and temporal lesions inhibit the uncontrollable laughter sometimes brought on by psilocybin. That said, I would also think it could be the latter, that parietal lesions make you more susceptible to pathological laughter. Maybe we'll come across a similar study examining this one day in the future, and we'll have a more definitive answer. Anyway, that's it for today's episode. As always, I really hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, feedback, or ideas for the podcast, please do let me know. You can find out all of the ways to reach me on the website, psilocybology.org, where you can also find the full transcript for each episode if interested. Thank you all for listening. 
and I'll talk to you next time.